So that song, Blessed Assurance, I checked it just to make sure I was right. Who knows who wrote it? Fanny Crosby. Somebody else tell me what's special about Fanny Crosby. She was blind. She's blind. I said somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> She's blind. If you were blind for years, would you praise your Savior all day long? I hope so. I hope so. But Fanny Crosby wrote so many wonderful hymns. One of the ones I think about uh, that I love this concept. She's blind and she wrote the song, When My Life's Work Is Ended and I Cross the Great Divide. Yeah. The, I want to see my Savior, first of all. She's blind, and what all the things she could see, she wants to see her Savior, first of all. Uh, she has some wonderful hymns, and so by all means, if you're not familiar with the hymns of Fanny Crosby, uh, look them up and listen to them and sing them and learn them. Uh, but praising our Savior all day long, I hope that you have come with an attitude of praise that you aren't just coming out of ritual. There's a lot of people who go to church, oh, it's Sunday, got to go to church today. I hope you've been looking forward to coming to church today and looking forward to praising the Lord because he is so very faithful to us. Uh, hopefully on the way in, you picked up a worship folder. Yours might look a little bit different. We're using up some old bulletin stock over the next couple months, but uh, make sure you read through, highlight things that pertain to you. Number one, uh, stay for lunch today. We're having a potluck potluck lunch and we have lots of good things i know so uh, plan to stay and eat lunch with us today coming up tomorrow food delivery if you can help us in the morning for the food delivery uh, show up around 8 15 and we'll have a truck come with our food tuesday ladies bible study wednesday food distribution as well as elders meeting so a lot of different things coming up this week then uh, we support two kids down in Brazil, brother and sister, George and Giovanna. By a show of hands, who saw what George got for his birthday with what we provided? One person. One person. Anybody? One person. Picture out on the board. Uh, we sent some money and George picked out something and, and we got a picture of George with his gift. So by all means, go out there and look at it. You can read some recent letters from George and Giovanna of how they're doing in school and how their progress is. So uh, please, do. We, we love to have you give toward their support, but especially pray for George and Giovanna. And you think, what do I pray about? What would you want to pray about if you had a niece or nephew living down in a remote area of Brazil? So, you know, we can come up with hundreds of things to pray for. We simply need to make sure we take the time to pray. A uh, couple updates there, but let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Father, it is so good to know that we can come to you anytime, day or night, and you're always there. You're ready to listen. You invite us to come boldly to your throne, and we come to you as our Father, as your children, and we just want to tell you that we love you today. Uh, Lord, we want to praise you, your name all day long. And so we're so glad we can meet together as uh, brothers and sisters to corporately praise your name. Thank you for the help that you've given to Eli. Thank you, Lord, for the, the way that you have given us the opportunity to share the food with others. And thank you for having copies of your word that we can meet together and study together. And Lord, we thank you that even as we meet, you are present here with us today. And that is what makes this time of worship meaningful and worthwhile. We pray that you would be glorified and that we would be changed to be more like you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
If you have your Bibles, you can join me in turning to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Today, I will be very upfront with you. Our sermon may be a little bit longer than normal, and I'm only getting going to go through half the chapter. I thought about doing the whole chapter, and I thought, there's no way I'll cover that. So even just covering the first few verses, it may be a little bit longer. But the wonderful news is we don't have to go home and fix lunch. It's already here, so we are in good condition, and I will definitely get you out in plenty of time before noon, so we'll have plenty of time for lunch. But this morning we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Do you ever do house hunting? Some people go online and they look at all these listings of houses for sale. And they uh, think what it would be like to live in another house. And, you know, you think about how nice it would be not to have to go up and down steps to go up the steps to the bedroom or down the steps to the laundry just to have a ranch house all be in one floor. Other people think, oh, it would be nice to have my own washer and dryer in the house and not have to go out to the laundromat. Other people say, oh, it would be wonderful to have a garage so I don't have to go out and scrape the the frost off the windshield of the car in the cold mornings. And We dream about all these things it would be nice to have in a new house. Other people do their house hunting in person. Uh, They'll go out and they'll see signs, open house. And they say, oh, let's go in and check out the open house. A lot of times they do it just because they're nosy. Uh, (laughs) They're not looking to buy the house. They just want to go in and check out the house. But thinking about house hunting, new homes. Well, today we are going to talk about house hunting as we continue on in 2 Corinthians. Not about a new house on the other side of town, but about a new house on the other side of eternity. Paul is writing here to a church that had wounded him and grieved his heart. He had confronted their sin, but they refused to repent. He thought about coming to them and really laying the law down, but he thought, I'm going to give God more time to work, and so he changed his plans to visit them. We talked about that in previous chapters. And he waited, and God worked in their hearts, and they repented, and they rejoiced, and Paul rejoiced, and they're praising the Lord. And then uh, Paul shares in chapter 1 how God comforts us so we in turn can comfort others. We saw in chapters 2 and 3 that Paul was able to deal with difficult people, people who doubted him, who maligned him, who says, you know, maybe that Paul, he needs to get a letter of recommendation from the real apostles at Jerusalem. How did Paul stay so positive? We talked last week about three things that kept Paul encouraged. The great privilege it is to serve God. The great power of God at work in the clay pots that we are. It's God's amazing power at work within us. And then maintaining a right perspective. Not focusing on the thing, all the things of this earth, but keeping our focus on eternity. We finished up last time in chapter 4, verse 16. And Paul says, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul knew what really mattered, the eternal. He writes in another place in 1 Timothy 4, physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. We have a society that loves to focus on outward appearance, on the physical body. Uh, We love the idea of perfection in bodies, so much so that in magazines they take beautiful models and they airbrush any little imperfection out because they want to create this illusion of perfection. Uh, People go in, they get liposuction to suck out 
excess fat. They get Botox injections so they won't have any wrinkles. Uh, they want to look perfect. What's Paul say? He says, outwardly we are wasting away. Our bodies are aging. We ache more and more the older we get. Uh, I have joined that club now and uh, appreciate all the aches and pains of aging. But we don't put our focus on the outward shell that we have. We focus on the inner self. Paul says, inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. So that leads us to ask the question, what are you doing to build your spirit? If I ask you, what you've done to help yourself physically, you can say, oh, I ate a good breakfast, or I did exercises, or I took my vitamins, or I'm going to go walk a mile this afternoon. But if I say, what have you done to build yourselves spiritually, what would you say? You say, well, I'm in church, aren't I? Yes, but Paul says, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Every day we should be doing things that build us spiritually. And that brings us to thinking about something we call the area of spiritual disciplines. Reading your Bible, praying, memorizing, meditating, witnessing, talking to others, sharing with us. All these things will help us build our inner man, help us to grow spiritually. And when we focus on our inner man, we become more and more like Jesus, which is our goal. So that brings us to chapter 5, where we want to look today. Paul has introduced this idea of the inner man, of the spiritual realm. It's not the physical, that's wasting away, focusing on the internal. And Paul reminds us that this is what really matters. He doesn't get discouraged at all the things that have happened in his life because he has a right focus. So I'm going to start reading here in 2 Corinthians 5 with verse 1. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan, and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord, so we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him, for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Let's pray together. Father, we come today knowing this is your word, and your word is truth. And we've just read these verses, but we need the help of the Holy Spirit to give us understanding, to turn the light on for us, to help us to perceive what it is you're saying and how it applies to our lives. May we each come away with instruction from you in your word today. And may we each gain something that will help us live more faithfully for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in this chapter, Paul is doing a little house hunting. He is thinking about changing from living in an earthly tent, our human bodies, to an eternal heavenly house, the home that God is building for us in heaven. And he says here, now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, 
not built by human hands. So Paul starts out with these words, now we know. Paul is saying that he's going to tell them something that they already know to be true. If they already know it to be true, why is he telling them? Because we all need to be reminded of what we know is true. So Paul wants them to think about the truth. They already know the truth, but they need to be reminded of it. They need to think about it, and so do we. Paul wants to redirect their focus because it can be so easy becoming distracted by all the things of this life, all the baubles that Satan flashes out in front of us, and all the worries and fears and burdens and problems we face, and all those things can take our focus off of the eternal, off of the God who is present to help us, off of the God working in our lives. So Paul is reminding us to help us keep a right focus. Remember last week I shared a quote from Corey Ten Boom. Uh, she said, look around and you'll be distressed. Look within and you'll be depressed. Look at Jesus and you'll be at rest. So Satan wants to distract us, but Paul is reminding us of what we know to be true. And Paul compares our present lives to living in a tent. He uses the same word that's used back in the Old Testament for the tabernacle. When the Jews wandered through the wilderness, there was this tent that got set up in the middle of their camp where the presence of God was. Tents are temporary shelters. They are flimsy. They're never designed to be lived in for the next 40 years. They're there for a short term, for a temporary purpose. Wonderful thing about tents, you can... Take one with you, travel wherever you go, and set it up in a matter of minutes, and you're good for the night. But you don't want to live your life in a tent. They're temporary. So Paul says our bodies, these temporary tents, will one day be destroyed. And actually that word destroyed is the same term for tearing down. So Paul is saying one day we are going to break up camp take our tent down. And when we do that, God has a permanent home prepared for us. He says, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. So we aren't designed to live in this tent forever. God has something better in store for us. So Paul is going to help us reflect in these verses about our heavenly home. First of all, we want to think about the desire for a new house. Understand that God wants us to be dissatisfied in this tent we live in. Sometimes we think about our bodies and all the limitations we have and aches and pains and think, why do I have this body? Well, God wants us to be dissatisfied because he has something better in store. So first of all, our earthly house is in a perishing condition. It says, outwardly, we are wasting away. When we're young and foolish, we think we can climb mountains, we can run marathons, we can swim the English Channel. But the older we get, the more limitations we have. Uh, sometimes we think it's all I can do to get up and walk across the room. Our earthly house is in a passing condition. Verse 17, he talks about our momentary troubles. Get to verse 18, for what is seen is temporary. The house we live in, the tent we live in now, it is only temporary. And our earthly house is in a painful condition. 5-2, meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. And then down in verse 4, for while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. Understand that as we age, we face the effects of our bodies growing older. And we face many burdens. The older we get, the more we groan. Solomon, 
lays this truth out beautifully in Ecclesiastes 12. He says there, remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. When the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease because there are few and those looking through the windows grow dim, when men rise up at the sound of birds but all their songs grow faint, when men are afraid of heights and dangers in the streets, when the grasshopper drags himself along and desire no longer is stirred, then man goes to his eternal home and mourners go about the streets. So ta Solomon talks here about a loss of pleasure. As people age, they come to the point where there's no pleasure. There's nothing they really are looking forward to anymore. And the things they used to enjoy doing just don't seem that enjoyable anymore. There is this sense of fatigue. Many times, senior adults just are worn out, fatigued. Solomon talks about the loss of physical health. And he gives this picture of aging. The keepers of the house tremble. Your arms and legs shake. Strong men stoop. You walk bent over. Your grinders cease. You start losing your teeth. Uh, windows grow dim. Your vision deteriorates. The doors are closed. Your hearing starts to fail. The sound of grinding fades. You can't chew your food anymore. You rise up with the birds. Sometimes you think you had a good night if you got four hours of sleep. Songs grow faint. Your voice starts to quake and quiver. There are so many physical ailments that go along with aging, and that brings frailty. The older we get, the more frail we become. Solomon then also talks about a loss of prowess, uh, the loss of feelings of security. He says, when men are afraid of heights and dangers in the streets, the older we get, the more fears we have. Fear of being alone. I know people who just are paralyzed by fear by living in a house by themselves. Fear of somebody breaking in. Fear of driving in traffic. Oh, I can't go down that street. That traffic's so bad. Uh, fear of poor health, fear of financial collapse, fear of being able to get the medicine you need. And the list of fears goes on and on. Satan plays upon our fears. And then a fourth picture Solomon gives is a loss of pace and perspective. He writes, the grasshopper drags himself along and desire no longer is stirred. Give you two different ideas here, and I think both are probably correct. One is the idea of pace. The grasshopper drags himself along. Uh, the older we get, the slower we go. One senior said, I felt like my body had gotten totally out of shape, so I got my doctor's permission to join a fitness club and start exercising. I decided to take an aerobics class for seniors. I bent, twisted, gyrated, jumped up and down, and perspired for an hour. But by the time I got the leotards on, the class was over. <laughs> <laughs> Often with aging is a definite slowing down of pace. The other idea, is King James has, and the grasshopper shall be a burden. The idea that even if a little grasshopper would land on your shoulder, it would be a great burden. The older we get, the more things bother us. When you're young, you can multitask and deal with all these issues at one time. But the older we get, we find just one little thing that's not on our schedule, not on our agenda, just throws us in a tizzy. Uh, the more we change our routines, the harder it is to accept. So with both pace and perspective, frustration comes along for seniors. So, back to 2 Corinthians 5. This fatigue and frailty and fear and frustration is meant to build within us 
a desire for a new house, to get out of this tent and get this new house that God has designed for us. We understand that our days in this tent are few. And the older we get, the fewer and fewer those days will be. Sometimes people who are 55, 60 talk about being middle-aged, but who lives to be 120? The reality is we're middle-aged when we hit about 45. When we hit 65, which is many of us here, we realize we are in the last quarter of our lives. And so as we age, we groan. There are a lot of groaning with the aches and pains of life. But we also groan with yearning and longing and expectation as we wait to get out of this tent and get to be in the Lord's presence and enjoy the new home he has built for us. Then let's think about the design for a new house. Understand that the home we are going to receive has been built by a master designer, an incredible architect. I saw in the paper a couple weeks ago that there is a house for sale in Kalamazoo that was built by Frank Lloyd Wright. There's actually two of them, I think. Uh, but the one house it's not really that big, not that special, but because it was built by Wright, they won $800,000 for it. Now understand, God himself is the designer, the architect, the builder of the new home we will receive. Verse 1 again, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven not built by human hands, so here is God's plan. We have a building from God. It's not a temporary structure. It's not a tent. It's a home we will enjoy forever. And then we see God's pattern. The pattern for our new house is to be just like Jesus. We are, are going to receive a new heavenly spiritual body that's just like Jesus. You say, that sounds a little bit heretical to me. It's not heretical, it's biblical. Uh, consider Philippians 3. Paul writes and says, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. God's pattern is that our bodies, this tent, when we put it off, we will receive a new home that's just like Jesus. Or consider 1 John 3, 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So we are going to be just like Jesus in our new building, our new home. Now, let's consider man's misunderstanding. Look at verse 3. Paul says, but because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. So what in the world is all this naked business about? Basically, what Paul is saying here is when we get rid of a tent and we go receive the new heavenly home, when he says we're not going to be naked, I think what he's saying is we're not going to be just disembodied spirits floating around. God takes us from one body to another. He's not going to leave us hanging. He's not going to just have us naked, not going to let us be unclothed. Back in Paul's day, the Greek says, you know, physical is evil, the body is evil, matter is evil, the spiritual is good. So their goal is to say, let's get out of the physical and let's just be spiritual. We'll just be beings floating around somewhere. They didn't want another body, they just wanted to be out of their body. 
Paul says, no, no, no. The goal is to have a new body. We won't be ghosts floating around. Sometimes uh, people will say, well, if you see a cardinal, that's a loved one who died who's coming back checking up on you. No, we're not coming back as cardinals. I remember once I did a funeral and the mother's at the casket just weeping about her daughter. And uh, her other daughter was there saying, don't worry, Mama, she's an angel now. No, we don't become angels. We aren't ghosts. We're not going to be floating on a cloud with a harp in our hands. We get a new spiritual body just like Jesus. Paul goes on, verse 4, to say, We do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. The literal uh, phrasing would be, we do not wish to put off, but to put on. So Paul is saying, the real desire we have is not just to get out of this body, not just to get rid of all the aches and pains. For a lot of people, that's their focus. Oh, I just wish I didn't hurt so much. Paul says it's not to be unclothed, but to be clothed. We don't want to just put off, we want to put on. Our focus is in receiving the new body that God has for us. One that 10 billion years from now will still be just as good as the day we receive it. And that is an area where Satan often misdirects our thinking. We face so many aches and pains in life that all we can focus on is just getting out of the pain. And we are distracted about the new body we have. Our focus shouldn't just be getting out of pain. It should be enjoying the new body that God has prepared for us. Paul had already shared this hope with the Corinthian church. Uh, back in his first letter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes this. He says, Our earthly bodies, which die and decay, will be different when they are resurrected, for they will never die. Our bodies now disappoint us, but when they are raised, they will be full of glory. They are weak now, but when they are raised, they will be full of power. They are natural human bodies now, but when they are raised, they will be spiritual bodies. Let me tell you a wonderful secret God has revealed to us. Not all of us will die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment. In the blinking of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, the Christians who have died will be raised with transformed bodies. And then we who are living will be transformed so that we will never die. When we keep our focus on putting on, on the new bodies we will receive, we will stay encouraged. So, we have a desire for a new home. We see the design of the new home. Thirdly, let's talk about the deed for a new home. How can we know for sure that this new home will be ours? When we buy a home, in that closing process, you end up getting a deed. That is your certificate, your proof that this home belongs to me. So, what does God do to assure us that this new home is ready for us to put on? He gives us the Holy Spirit. Verse 5. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. We talked about this a few weeks ago when we were back in chapter 1 where Paul wrote that God put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And this idea of the deposit, the down payment, in modern Greek is the word for an engagement ring. Now, when Rhonda and I were dating, I can tell this story because she's not here. Don't you tell them that I told her. But... When we were dating, she got tired of waiting for me to propose. 
So she proposed to me. She said, will you marry me? And I said, no, because I wanted to be the one to ask her. But shortly after that, I did ask her to marry me. And she said yes. What she really said was, is the Coke Catholic? She wanted to say, is the Pope Catholic? Like, of course I'll marry you. But she mixed up and said, is the Coke Catholic? But when I proposed, I gave her an engagement ring. Now, a little quick rabbit trail, nothing spiritual about this, but uh, when I knew, when I started dating her, shortly after I started dating her, I knew when her character and everything was flawless. I knew that if we would connect, I'd want to marry her. So shortly after we started dating, I went shopping for a ring. And I looked all over, went halfway across the state of Pennsylvania looking at different jewelers. I found a diamond, a stone. I bought the stone. And I, I custom made her engagement ring. I had a jeweler custom make it. I designed it, drew it out, and they made it. And I melted down my grandmother's wedding ring, my mother's wedding ring, and my mother's engagement ring. My mother, when she was married, just had a little wire thin one. And years later, she said, I'm going to buy myself a new bigger one. So my mother had bought a new wedding ring. So I took her rings and my grandmother's ring, melted them down to make Rhonda's engagement ring. But it is a, uh, a way that I'm saying, I am promising I'm going to marry you. Here's the proof. Here is the engagement ring. God has given us a sure sign that he is going to give us this new eternal body that he has promised us. And the deposit is the Holy Spirit. God himself who comes to live within us he lives within each of us who has trusted Christ as Savior. So we have been given the Holy Spirit, not just as a guarantee of our salvation, but as a guarantee that God has this plan in store for our, our future. He has this new heavenly home, this, this new spiritual body prepared for us. And that gives us faith to follow through knowing that God's going to follow through on all of his promises to us. We live with faith because we know God's going to keep his word. That's what Paul says in verse 7. We live by faith, not by sight. We haven't seen it yet, but by faith. We've already received the Spirit. We know it's coming, and so we trust that God is going to fulfill his word. Paul says in verse 6, We are always confident despite all the trials and troubles that Paul faced. Boy, you read through uh, Scripture several places, you see all that Paul went through. How does he stay encouraged? He lives by faith. In Hebrews 11, it talks about the Old Testament saints. And the key for each one in that chapter is they lived by faith. How did Abel offer the right sacrifice? He had faith. Why did Enoch walk with God? He had faith. Why does Noah build an ark? He, his faith that God was going to do what he said he was going to do and flood the earth. Why does Abraham leave his family and travel hundreds of miles? Faith. Why does Abraham offer up his son Isaac? Faith. Why does Moses turn his back on all the treasures of Egypt? Faith. Believe that God has something better in store for him. And so why does Paul endure all these trials and tribulations? Faith. Paul had faith that God had something better in store for him. So Paul had such a strong faith that what God said was true, that he wanted, he longed, he groaned to get out of this body and get the new body that God had prepared for him. And that leads to our dilemma. The problem we face Verse 8, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. When we think about all that heaven holds for us and being in God's presence forever and getting out of this tent and getting the new home, yes, we long to get that. But the truth is, we can't. 
until our time of camping in this tent is done. Paul talked about that as he writes to the Philippians. He says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in this body. He says, oh, I, I want to go be with the Lord, but at the same time, I know you need me. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and join the faith so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Paul was ready to take down the tent, but he knew, <laughs> but God's not done with me yet. It's not my time to go. He's looking forward to the new home, but he also knew the dilemma, but God has a plan for me here. Even though he was ready to shell out, he chose to stay so that he could accomplish the plans of God. So, the dilemma. We want to go receive our new home, but we also need to stay in our tents until God is finished with us. That leads to our decision. Verse 9. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. No matter whether we're camping in our tents or whether we go and receive our permanent home, our greatest desire is to please the Lord. Because we know that one day God is going to settle up accounts. One day we'll, we will receive rewards from our Lord. And that's what Paul shares in verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Let's understand that it does make a difference how we live. When your focus is on the temporary, you get caught up in all the baubles of this world. Uh, Jesus reminds us in the Sermon on the Mount, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So instead of building our bank accounts and our 401ks, yes, it's good to save but our focus should be on eternal things. Our focus should be on spiritual things. Our focus is not making ourselves great, but making our God great, declaring his praises. What is it that we really need in life? Very little, really. Advertisers will tell us, oh, you need this big SUV, it's only $100,000, uh, but you need it, you deserve it. Don't you want it? Paul tells Timothy, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Realize that every day we are in a fight. We are in a battle against all the temptations that come our way. We need to intentionally choose not to give in to temptation, to resist the devil and he will flee from us. Ties in with another verse, uh, 1 Peter 2.11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. The New Living Translation words it, keep away from evil desires because they fight against your very souls. So we are in a fight to focus on the eternal. Satan wants us to distract us, to take our focus off of eternal things and focus on things of the world. But we need to keep our focus. That's why Paul is reminding them and us 
This is just a tent. We have something better coming. And Paul says as Christians, we will stand before God and give a report to God one day. We don't stand before the great white throne judgment. We see that in Revelation 20. That's for unbelievers. And uh, every unbeliever at the great white throne judgment will face e damnation to hell eternally. But for believers, for Christians, we have a different judgment. The judgment seat of Christ. This is a judgment of our works. Now some people say, Pastor, you know, we're not saved by our works. No, we are saved by faith, but we are judged by our works. We will be judged for whether what we have done has any eternal value. Some will receive condemnation. Some will face the truth that their works were of no value. Uh, Paul says in, here in verse 10, there are two results. Our works can either be good or bad. The word bad isn't the idea of evil. It's vain, empty, worthless. There are a lot of things we do, may not be wrong, may not be sinful, but it's no eternal value. We need to focus on things that have eternal value. A lot of Christians spend their time on things that really don't matter in light of eternity. But when we choose to keep a right focus, we live in such a way so that God can say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. We desire a new home. We see the design of the new home will be just like Jesus. God gives us the deed to the new home. We already have the Holy Spirit as the down payment, as the guarantee, as the engagement ring. We know it's coming. And so we make the decision to live for God faithfully every day. May God help us to be faithful to him this week. Let's pray together. Father, this is a good reminder for each of us that this life is not all there is. And you have something better planned for us. And so, Lord, we do groan. Yes, we at times groan because of the aches and pains of our body. But we especially groan with longing and desire to receive that new home that you have prepared for us to be in your presence and enjoy you forevermore. And that gives us hope to live by faith every day. That keeps us encouraged. That keeps us going on. So help us, Lord, to live in such a way that you may say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.